Mario, you got to come in there.
this my own song right here real quick. You know, there's times in our lives where uh, we just kind of sit back and wonder what the heck's going on and why we gotta why we gotta be here. And I'm only I only see my own stuff because I know the environment I'm in. I wouldn't probably do this at a normal place just because I know that there's people who feel the same as me. So I want you to just listen to the words. I was an 18 year old kid singing this stuff. Um, and, uh, no. Austin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can see you in the distance, looking so good. I just want to end this. I don't want to love. I don't need these world treasures because they're only temporary. Another day alone, I give my life to Jesus now. He's the only reason how my buddies never walked in on me. Body laying on the ground, not a sound. Nobody even knows. My depression's getting worse every time that I think of home. I wanna drown out. I love my memories. I hate the fact that I gotta remember these. Every time I think about the past and the future, I know I'm losing. I'm using my negativity, channeling in the music. I'm doing what I've been doing since Katie said it was stupid, but lately I've been. Music, and I don't know my views. Can they get me there? Nah, nah, nah. But I know you can get me there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I say. Yeah. It's okay. It's alright. Just gotta make it on into the night. It's okay. It's alright. Just gotta make it through one more night. But I'm so scared.
Seen this one super long. I just want to, I just want to give him thanks in the middle of the sermon. Mm-hmm.
stand up, the Lord just give me a little down food. And then I just, he just started taking me through this scene. And it's, it starts like this. Man, it's so hot in here. <laughs> Man, I'm tired of standing up. Man, so-and-so said this. He didn't clean his room. He's not pulling his way. I do all the work around here. Or we get into the church where it's cool. And it's like, oh, these people are judging me. These people are fake. And our attention is everywhere else. But on Jesus. And I just believe that Jesus is calling us all to that place. Where we just see him in his glory. We just see him in his beauty. And we as a group of men just gather together to praise him in season and out of season. Like he is raising up a generation to praise him. I just believe that. I just see that in you. I see that in you. But let's quit that discontent. Let's stop that discontent. It's hot every summer. It's cold every winter. And you can always find something to complain about, but you can always find something to praise him for. of what we do here, at least in my life, was serving today. You know, uh, community. You know, I, when, when I feel like I'm, when I feel like I'm alone, even though I lead this, and people might think that I'm just out here doing it for attention or something. I don't know, but uh, I don't need that for real. To be honest with you, um, I need community. I need friends. I didn't have that before I, I was here. I was thinking of this yesterday, my tire blew out. And before I came here, I had nobody to call. I had Austin, but other things had uh, taken place in, in my lives and I didn't even feel comfortable really calling him because I felt like I had screwed up too much or something. But I want y'all to know, like at least in my life, that y'all helped me out, like even just this morning, just being here. God helped me more than y'all did, but y'all helped. But like, <laughs> but that's the purpose when it, when God talks about community. I believe it. He talks about it in Matthew. Correct. I should be reading it soon. But uh, I just know that it's important. And I know that when I met Pastor Donnie the first time, one of his biggest things he talked about when we were at church together was family in the garden. And I, and I feel like I, I experienced what that's supposed to feel like this morning. So I just want to thank you guys. Praise God. But, uh, yeah. God, thank you for this opportunity to grow, to love you. God, thank you for the fire. <coughs> Lord, when, when we don't we don't necessarily know how things are going to go, God, that uh, you give us peace in, in a time that someone without you would not have peace. But God, I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Some folks, I, I grew up in a, in a church where you're more likely to hear an organ going than a, than a drum beat. And it doesn't matter what the music is like. The point is who we're worshiping and you know, the relationship you're developing with him. You can have a preference in music. I love what we do here. I appreciate Tyler and, and Donnie and, you know, the whole bunch, Austin. That, and it, what a blessing to, to have them leading us in worship. God really wants to wants us to know him and to follow him. And 
It's interesting to me. Everything kind of fit together. This morning, last night, I was praying about what to share with y'all. Usually throughout the week, I'm praying. Sometimes the Lord will say, "Okay, I want you to work on this for a season, for a few weeks, or for a period of time." Sometimes I'm not sure. And so last night, all week long, I was praying. Well, what am I supposed to share with the guys? You know, and sometimes about eight o'clock at night, when you know you're going to speak in the morning, you're like, "Well, Lord." I guess we're going to wing it if you don't show up. And you know what? God shows up. And what the Lord really started putting on my heart goes along with part of what you're saying today even in the worship time. And, you know, it's, it's really coming down to a simple thing. As, as I think about us, I see guys who succeed fabulously beyond our wildest dreams. I see guys struggling. And... What happens is sometimes the guy who's struggling feels all alone in it. He feels isolated, and how am I going to get through? And you know, what, even what you shared today, I, I thought it was it was kind of funny. I was sitting over on the sides, and part of me starts going, "Man, it's it's hot and humid today." And I, all of a sudden, I just felt the Lord spoke to my heart. Am I in charge? Yeah. Well, if my comfort was all that important, God would have made the entire earth air conditioned all the time. His com my comfort, my feeling really good isn't all it's about. My obeying him, whether it's hot or cold, whether it's humid, whether it's raining, whether it's a drought, my surrender to him is really what's important. And you know what probably one of the most powerful, most commonly quoted uh, passages in the Bible, um, oftentimes when I've been called to somebody's hospital room when somebody's dying. One of the passages that you go to, one of the passages at funerals a lot of times, not that we're planning a funeral, anybody dying sin or anything here, but it's the 23rd Psalm. And the very part of, first part of that, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know, there's, there's this imagery, sometimes, a green pasture, you've got to go through a dry spot to get to that green pasture. When he leads you beside the still waters, you know, there are in still waters everywhere. God wants to lead you to that place where he provides for you. I like how it says it in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, I think it's verse 27, where it says that he is our shepherd and that his sheep will know his voice. And you know, as we're sitting here, Lord, what am I supposed to do? I had um, recently uh, reading some stuff about the Civil War, which is a fascinating time. I hadn't read so much about the start of the Civil War before. And in the months leading up to the United States breaking out into this huge war, more <laughs> Americans were killed in the Civil War than in any war, in, in all the wars in U.S. history from the very beginning up through Vietnam, about 750,000 to a million Americans were killed in the Civil War. And it appeared from 1861 to 1865. And you know how it all began? It was because people didn't know what to do. There, was, there were two sides in America. You had the abolitionists who wanted to abolish slavery. You had the pro-slavery folks in the South, and, and a bunch of confusion. It's interesting when you read about it. In South Carolina, where there were more slaves per capita than any place, the landowners were like, hey, we're holding on to slavery no matter what. This is the most important thing. And they kept talking about what they wanted. And they were afraid Abraham Lincoln was going to get elected president, and he was going to set all their slaves free. And, the world was going to be turned into a into term of what if our slaves rise up or, or they're set free and all this stuff happened. And Lincoln was like, hey, I want to be president. Slavery is going to go away, but I'm not going to just abolish slavery. Well, they didn't believe what they heard, and so they seceded from the Union in South Carolina, and they asked other states to join them. So the United States started falling apart. And right in the middle of Charleston, South Carolina, in the harbor was this fort called Fort Sumster. Sumter. There was a U.S. major there who was had 75 men in his command. Now, if any of you have been in the military, you know, if you look at Abel, we got this uh, company out in the middle of, of Salem, Alabama. You got more people that answered you than Major Anderson had answered to him at this fort. 
It was a tiny fortress, 75 men, a bunch of cannons. And his biggest thing is he kept saying, what am I supposed to do? He would send letters off to, they didn't have telephones. They didn't have, you know, it's like, you know, Major Anderson went, okay, got better reception over here. <laughs> hey, what am I supposed to do? South Carolina seceded from the Union because they, they were just fearful. They were overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. And in the middle of their fear, somebody's going to do something I don't want. They seceded from the Union. Major Anderson, this U.S. Army post in the middle of Charleston, South Carolina, this little state now says, we're our own country. We don't answer you anymore. So here's this major going, what am I supposed to do? Should I give them this fort? They say they, South Carolina now owns this fort, but I got an American flag flying over it. I got 74 <laughs> soldiers following me. And so for months, this guy holds out and he keeps sending letters to Washington. What am I supposed to do? They had a president, James Buchanan, who was one of the more incompetent presidents we've ever had. And he didn't know what to do. And he was, you know, they, you read stuff, he could, well, we could give South Carolina this fort, and, or we could fight and protect our property. And if we give them this fort, what will that mean? You know, nobody knew what to do. And so as Major Anderson is sitting there running out of food, eventually they, um, they were living in darkness. They ran out of candles. They didn't have electricity, of course, back then because they didn't know a good contractor. And, um, <laughs> had they only had your number, we would have been good. They ran out of candles. They ran out, they were running out of everything. And in the middle of this harbor was this one Union outpost, this American outpost, with 75 soldiers going, I guess we just wait here until we figure it out. Finally, the South, <laughs> as they're communicating with us, well, we want this and we want that. And what happens is the whole way through, this one major is sitting there in the harbor going, well, I guess I'm a good soldier and I'm gonna hold my post until I'm relieved. And eventually the governor of South Carolina said, okay, you gotta surrender your post to us or we're gonna start fighting. And then all of a sudden he said, well, you know, if the army doesn't relieve me, then I guess I'll surrender eventually. We're running out of food. He had only days left when he was down to literally their last meal. They were on half rations, eating half the food they wanted. They were in a dark, dark place. And as they're sitting there, all of a sudden, one day, the South fires a warning shot, and then all these batteries open up around them and start bombing them. There were about 6,000 Confederate soldiers, South Carolina troops, against 75 Union troops and nobody knew what to do. So they just said, well, hell, let's blow something up, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's about how it happened. And all of a sudden, war breaks out. Nobody, everybody was just like, and people are dying. You know, it, it reminds me of Hosea chapter six, where it says that for lack of knowledge, my people perish. Well, they reject my word. They reject my commands and they perish. They didn't know what to do. God, well, God doesn't lead us like Major Anderson, where you're just on. Sometimes it feels like that. I'm just on some outpost. I guess I'm going to hold on until either God kills me or somebody arrests me or something. The reality is, God loves you right where you are. And, you know, I love how it says it in John 10 when it talks about my sheep will know my voice and follow me. The good shepherd, he, you know, he is in it with you. Psalm 23, where it says, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Because God is sitting there going, hey, buddy, come on, let's go this way. He's not saying, hey, stop that, get out of there, behave yourself. God's sitting here, hey, I love you. Would you walk with me? And he just, you know, a good shepherd will lead you where he wants you to go. Because he loves you right where you are. There's no harshness. There's no, man, i got to guess what I'm going to do. Lord, where are you? When Josh gave up and gave us a word of encouragement this morning, it's because he's sitting there going, 
is I, I'm sitting over on the side because I'm old and old people don't like sitting in front of speakers. It's weird. You get old, you know, you move slower and you don't sit in front of speakers anymore. So I'm on the side over here and I'm praising and I look over and Josh is over here just, you know, asking the Lord, speak to me or guide me. And all of a sudden he's like, I need to encourage these guys. They need to hear this word. Don't, don't complain, don't write. Follow me. You know, I don't know if, if, if y'all have ever been around sheep and shepherds and stuff like that. Um, I've never owned sheep. I've owned goats and chickens and ducks and uh, cow, horse, uh, all kinds of dogs, a cat or two. Uh, nobody really owns a cat. Cat owns you, but that's different. But, but, but uh, um, some, um, you know, but what happens with, with sheep, the reason that God says he's a good shepherd and he calls us his sheep is sheep respond to, to their master's voice and they follow. If I had a big field with all kinds of sheep, everybody, if we voted in here, who's nicer, me or Chris? Everybody vote Chris. Yeah. I mean, I would vote Chris as nice. I mean, Chris is nice. He's, he's nicer than me, you know, and by a long shot. But if my sheep are in my field and I, they get to know my voice, I say, you know, walk out and warn, hey, girls, how you doing? They're like, hey, you know, dad's home, you know. And they come running over. And I want to go on vacation. So I say, hey, Chris, would you watch my sheep? And, you know, Chris goes out there and he's like, you know, hey. All the sheep are like, whatever. Because <laughs> the sheep begin to know their master's voice. Doesn't matter, you know, where it is. But so sheep, sheep sitting is not a real thing. Shepherds stay with their sheep. They don't abandon their sheep. In John chapter 10, he says he's not going to abandon you. He's, he's on duty all the time. In the dry season, when it feels like, where am I going to go? The good shepherd's still there going, hey, buddy, love you. Come in. It's a little dry right now, but I'm taking you to a green spot. Taking you where there's still water. But I want to go over here. You know, I, I love, I read a lot of stuff about sheep because I, I read a lot of stuff. <laughs> and one of the dumbest things ever in history was this event. I, I've mentioned this before. Up in, in the country of Turkey, um, back years ago in a storm, there was a group of shepherds and they had this, pulled together thousands and thousands of sheep. And they said, okay, we got to get these sheep out of this one area to the safer place. And so they head up over this mountain as the storm's breaking out. And the shepherd's singing and he has some bells going. And so the sheep know where he is. And they're following their shepherd. And they go up over this mountain. And as they're going up, all of a sudden, one day, one of the sheep says, as they're following, says, I think I'll go that way. And they take off in the wrong direction. And all the sheep behind that one start following the dumb sheep that's going the wrong direction. You know what happened? Um, in the morning, they realized about half their sheep were gone, and they went back up the mountain, and over the edge of a cliff, there were 3,000 dead sheep at the bottom of where they followed the, they followed a sheep instead of the shepherds. And what God is wanting you to know is that, man, whatever you're going through, he loves you. Your good shepherd is taking you from the storm, from the drought, from the dry place, from the heat, from the, you know, they, they do. When it says, oh, he'll, we'll have green pastures and to lead us beside still water. It's this beautiful oasis kind of scene. In the midst of all the struggle, I just sit there going, man, I just love you. Would you follow me? And God, you know, I will encourage you guys it's easy to complain and whine and stuff like that. When you read about Major Anderson, he was complaining, I don't know what my orders are. What am I supposed to do? You know what? As a believer, I never have to say that. Because my good shepherd is always there going, hey, buddy, follow me. I got one of my good friends down in South Florida uh, was a Delta Force operator. And Delta Force guys are, are real, real hardcore, tough customers. Um, 
they're usually not fresh recruits. They they don't become Delta Force usually until they're in their thirties. They're they're all grown up. They're not out just chasing stuff. They're just like, okay, what do we need to do? And he said, you know, it's interesting to talk to him. He said, you know what the greatest greatest tool I had in combat was, and he he had this gun range where he could shoot thousand yard shots like nobody's business. I'm thinking, yeah, what kind of caliber rifle? You know, greatest tool I had wherever I was was always there. Mm. He said, my usually Delta Force guys go out two by two. They have little shooting teams where it's a shooter and a spotter. And he said, wherever we were, we were just like, you know, the most of us were really committed Christian guys. And we learned to hear God's voice. And we would be going down one path and we'd be like, I don't feel like the Lord wants us there. We need to go back. And they'd back up, then they'd go back around. They'd see there was an ambush set for them. They would see there was trouble. They would be in a spot, you know, and every time along the way. Now imagine that. These are guys out here armed, trained, equipped, ready to take on anything. And their number one weapon, their number one tool, was not their training, millions of dollars worth of training, was not their satellite, wasn't their um, communication, wasn't their weapon. It was, Lord, will you guide me? Will you direct me? He said several times in the course of his career, they would post up in a spot where they were ready to shoot a bad guy. They were sent to places where they took long shots at bad guys <laughs> way off. They might have been reading the paper and didn't even know a bullet was coming their way. And as they're about to pull the trigger, he said one time, we started this tradition. I'm about to do my job. And my partner said, let's pray for him real quick. And before this wicked, evil guy that's trying to destroy millions of people, before they pull the trigger, they say, Lord, we're about to do our duty. Would you bless this guy that we're going, that's on the other end of this? Would you even call him to yourself now? And he said, one time as they're getting ready, and he looks down the scope, and a guy right as they're about to shoot him bows his head. And he did his job. Wow. Man. I mean, even at the very last, a wicked guy repents. Because the Lord is in him. You know, read the paper. You don't think it's about to end. But the reality is God loves you right where you are, guys. Wars don't have to rage in your heart and your mind. If there's war around you, you can know the Prince of Peace. Amen. If there's raging storms, our house is built on the rock of God's word and upon his love for us and his guidance. Wherever you find yourself right now, you know, God would look at you and say, I love you right where you are. I brought you here because I love you. Sometimes we don't want to stay in a place like this. You'll get offended. If you're not offended, hang out with me eventually. I'll offend you. You know, it'll happen. If, you, if I don't do it, hang out with Josh. He'll offend oh, yeah. you. You know, he's like, he you know, yeah, he's, you know, we could get on an offense a <laughs> I'm going to do my thing. You can't tell me. And the whole way, Lord, the good shepherd is going, I love you. I brought you to this pasture. Difficult season as I'm taking you to a place of absolute freedom, of total victory, of walking in abundance. So I just, I want to encourage you guys, you know, if there is somebody here, and I believe there always is in a room this side, this is enough of us, that's sitting here, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Don't do anything, sit back and say, Lord, would you guide me? Learn to hear his voice, because I believe John 10, 27 is right. The good shepherd is there going, hey, buddy, come this way. Come here, let's go. There's a place of safety, a place of freedom. And you start walking off, all of a sudden you see, there it is. You don't have to be in the middle of conflict. Whatever is raging about you, you can be at peace. You can be that joyful, peaceful man that is sitting here saying, Lord, I just thank you. 
God's going to work out his plans and his purposes. He is calling y'all to a place of really knowing him. And my, my concern is, I guess I'll wrap up real quick. Is that the saddest thing in the world would be that in this place, there would be guys who are trying to decide what do I want to do. The Holy Spirit is here. They okay, love you, buddy. Just listen. Do what I'm telling you to Because the good shepherd is never going to lead you wrong. He's never going to lead you to a place you shouldn't go. He's never going to lead you. If it looks desperate, it's because there's something really cool about to happen. He just loves you right where you are. And he calls you by name. When he looks at you, he says, Tyler, I love you. Just follow me. Well, what am I supposed to do? Oh, shh. Follow me. Follow me. It's good. I got this. But I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You don't have to. You know, you're, you're one of those sheeple. You're supposed to show us all the shepherd. Just follow me. It's okay. You don't, you don't know what to do. You do to listen to my voice and follow me. Well, what am I going to do if the... Shut up. <laughs> shepherd, shh. Stop making stupid sounds and follow me. But, but I am, uh, you know, and we're making stupid sounds. You just said, follow me. I love you. And that's really God's call to all of you. Call to me. He is my shepherd. And as a sheep, Lord, I want to obey you. I want to hear your voice, and Lord, I thank you that I can and that I do. I want to follow you, and Lord, we want that for each other. There's not a man here that we don't want to hear your voice today. We want him to hear and to know and to be able to follow you. Lord, lead us to those green pastures which you promise you will. Guide us beside the still waters to that place of peace and victory in the presence of our enemies. Lord, you prepare a peace for us because we don't have to deal with the times like you do. Lord, we thank you that when we surrender to you, everything is so plain and clear. Guide us to that place of peace and victory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Right here. This guy? Yeah. Oh, you got it? Uh, you hear that? Uh,